I'm Bob and I'm an alcoholic. Would you help me open this meeting with a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I hope everyone had a good night's rest. <laughs> This is our anonymity statement. There may be some here who are not familiar with our tradition of personal anonymity at the public level. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Thus, we re respectfully ask that no AA speaker or indeed any AA member be identified by full name or photograph in published or broadcast reports of our meetings. The assurance of anonymity is essential in our effort to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share our recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA principles come before personalities. And this is our preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thanks, Al. Uh, this morning we, we've asked a speaker to come in and, and share with us that uh, I know a little bit about him and like that because he's from my local uh, area and uh, I know he's very involved in, in service work and has done a lot in his community and like that and uh, we'd let, would you take and help me welcome Roy. Good morning. My name is Roy, and I'm an alcoholic. I came into this program the same way each of you did, but through a lot of pain. I finally surrendered. What brought me to that pain was many years of self-destructive living. I was born into an alcoholic family. My father was a violent alcoholic. And as a little child, I used to watch him beat my mother, black and blue and bloody, and the police come and haul him off. And I remember standing before the judge holding my mother's hand. I grew up in fear, absolute fear and terror of my father. And I kept telling myself those words we've all heard, I'll never be like that. For me, that was the alcoholic the one that would beat up on innocent people. I started drinking in my teen years, and then in my 20s, the drinking increased. In my 30s, it increased even more. And in my 40s, I started going into blackouts more and more frequently. I worked in a college, in universities, and I was the party man. I was referred to as the oldest teenager on campus. <laughs> I used to say I had a troubled childhood. It lasted 55 years. <laughs> and I would have parties in the dorm, in my room in the dorm, because I was one of, the, one of the moderators in the dormitory, and I lived there. <clears throat> and I would have parties, and sometimes the parties would get out of hand. And I would come to the next morning lying on the floor of my room and I wonder how the party ended and I would wonder whom I had offended what I had done and I would hang my head in shame and look at my shoe tops and my toes as I walked across the campus wondering who was going to laugh and what they would say I worked in various colleges I spent a number of years working as oceanographer 
and I sailed on many ships to different ports of the world. And literally, I don't even remember some of the countries I've been to. And I would say to myself after each event, Roy, you've got to watch your drinking. It's getting out of hand. I was on a research vessel down off the coast of North Carolina doing some work on the Gulf Stream, and we put into port in Moorhead City, and the captain, some of the mates, and I went out to hit the taverns. And I remember there slamming, throwing us out of one place and slamming the door on us, and I punched the door back, and my fist went right through it. I got 27 stitches down my arm that I still carry as witness to that drunken behavior. And I remember they stitched me up and brought me back to the ship, and I said to myself, Roy, you'd better watch your drinking. It's getting out of hand. I was at a university in Ohio, and we had alumni reunion in June. And I called up some of the students who had gone home for the summer. I said, hey, there's open bar, 15 different tents around the university campus. We can make the rounds free. So a bunch of the guys came back, and we made the rounds. And the next morning I came to in my room, the dorm. Felt like I had a hat on. I put my hand up and I tugged on it, and it was bandages. And I asked one of the kids who was there, I said, what's this from? He says, well, they put that on in the hospital when they stitched you up last night. I said, what happened? He said, you fell backward down the front steps of the dorm, cracked your head. I said to myself, Roy, you'd better watch your drinking. It's getting out of hand. And I would sit, when I would go to the faculty club where I had my meals, I would sit with my back to the wall so no one could see the place where they shaved my head and see the stitches that were there. And all this time, I was becoming the alcoholic. The way I define alcoholic is that I was doing things I never wanted to do, except I had been drinking. I had become the kind of person I never wanted to be except I was drinking. And I kept telling myself, Roy, you've got to watch your drinking. It's getting out of hand. And I watched it year by year. I watched it get worse. The final drunk was one Labor Day weekend, the end of a long summer. And the last day of the summer, one of the young men, engineering student, been working with me, gave me a gift as a token for the work of the summer, a bottle of Chevis Regal. And, of course, you have to toast. I mean, you can't just accept it and not open it. And that started about 5 in the afternoon. The faculty club had some wine with the dinner, some cordials afterwards, went back to the dorm. Some of the boys had come back early to so sneak in a few extra days of practice in rugby or soccer. And they knew where the party pad was, and they came on down and brought their six packs, and I had some of my own stuff there, and we partied. And went on into the night, and I have vague recollections drifting in and out of a blackout that there were continually changing of, of people present and the hollering and shouting and the TV and the ceremonies of the drinking. And the next morning I came to on my living room floor again. But this time the room was different. This time there was blood around the room. And there was a broken window. And I had that feeling in my stomach. Roy, you've got to stop your drinking. I didn't know what had happened. I couldn't remember. And I was terrified. And a little later, there was a knock on the door, and the president of the university asked, Are you alone? I said, Yes. And he came in and closed the door. And he said, You had a party here last night? And I said, Yes. He said, Somebody got injured. I said, So it appears. He said, Well, it wasn't one of the college students. It was a kid from the neighborhood who had crashed your party. And he went home bleeding to death, and his parents took him to the hospital where they stitched him up. And they took him to the police station where they filed criminal charges. And he says, there's a warrant out for you. And he says, and I've arranged for a criminal lawyer to handle the case. And I have your resignation here. Will you please sign it? That was Saturday morning. I sat and I shook. 
I was too scared to cry. Saturday passed. I had very little to eat. Drank a little bullion. Drank some milk. Sunday came. Sunday night I was Grand Marshal at the university graduation for the summer graduation. And I asked a friend of mine if he would stand by because I didn't know but I might collapse. I might faint. He said, you're usually not scared in front of audience. What are you afraid of? I said, I don't know. I just feel so weak. I was terrified. Sunday night passed. Monday was Labor Day. And I just sat and shook. Tuesday came. And Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, I had a meeting with the criminal lawyer. And I drove down into the city, and I got there early because I didn't know where the location, where the address was, but I found it rather quickly. And it was right across the street from the cathedral. And I walked across the street, and I sat in the back pew of the cathedral. And I sat, and I shook. And I realize now in retrospect that it was during that hour that I waited to go up to the lawyer's office that I did the first three steps of the program. I admitted I was powerless over alcohol. It had brought me to do things I never wanted to do, become the kind of person I never wanted to be. My life was unmanageable. I didn't know what the future held. I knew my job was over. I didn't know if I would ever be hireable again. I didn't know but what I might be in jail. I just didn't know. And I surrendered. I just gave up. And I said, God, I don't know what you have in store for me, but obviously it's not up to me anymore. But I had had a great faith in God. I grew up, my mother's side of the family is Polish, and I guess that says enough. The side of the Polacks that's the greatest is their faith. Their faith. And I had that faith. And I just turned it over. I said, God, it's up to you. It's up to you. I left there and I went to the lawyer's office and the lawyer explained the nature of the charges and what's the worst possible and what's the best possible to be hoped for. He said, we're working now with friends who know the family that are trying to get the charges dropped. And it would help if you went to rehab. It would help not only in terms of the charges, but it would help for your own personal health. And so I drove to rehab. I stopped off to finish packing my belongings, took what I could with me in the car. I weighed myself out of curiosity, and I had lost 15 pounds in four days. I hadn't eaten. I hadn't had anything to drink. Just a few, a little broth, a little water. And I drove up to Michigan to a rehab. And I walked in there and I said, well, I'm here for an evaluation. <laughs> and after five minutes, what they could get through my tears, they said, why don't you unpack your bag? And they called the lawyer to see if the, I would be allowed to reside outside of the state while the hearings were taking place. And I took my room, I unpacked my bag, and I went downstairs to the chapel. There was a chapel in this rehab. And there was a large banner hanging on the wall that says, Be at peace, you are safe here. And suddenly I felt safe. I felt like I was in God's arms. I was one of 35 men at that rehab one of 35 Catholic priests, including one archbishop. And there we were, each of us, addressing an illness that we didn't realize we had. When I arrived at that place, it's called Guest House. It's a rehab for Catholic priests and brothers. I walked in there full of shame and guilt feeling like I was the Judas that had betrayed Christ. And I heard the good news. You're not bad. You're sick. That's all. I'm just sick. I'm sick. I'm not bad. And sick people do sick things. That doesn't make the sick things good. It just says that you're sick. And you can get well. You can get well. 
the great gift of knowing that alcoholism is a disease. It's not a moral defect. It's a disease. And suddenly, I was home. I was home. It was okay to be sick. But I had an obligation, I had an obligation to do what I could to help those in whom I had entrusted my health to get well. And I began the slow process of growth. This disease is a physical disease. It's an emotional disease. It's a mental disease. And it's a spiritual disease. And physically, I began to get my health back. I stopped shaking. I could, my blood pressure dropped back to normal. Gradually, I got my mental health back. It took a good number of years, and many would allege I'm not there yet either. <laughs> Gradually, my emotions are beginning to fall back into place. Gradually. And gradually, my spiritual health is getting better. I like to dwell on that for a moment because spiritual health is like the other aspects of health. It takes a while to get sick, and it takes a while to get well. I didn't get spiritually well all at once. It took time to be comfortable once again with my sense of God and my relationship to God because I had destroyed that relationship. And it took time to begin to shed the fear, the anxieties. And there are various steps along that road to recovery, spiritual recovery. And I remember so well one night the Hotel Syracuse, an AA speaker got up, looked around the room, got eye contact with everybody in the room, and he said, I love each one of you, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> my first reaction was to say, hey, boy, I'm going to put that in my list of things I can say when I talk in meetings. <laughs> and then it dawned on me, that's what God was saying to me every day of my life. I love you. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. I love you. When I first surrendered and turned my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand that God, making that third step in the AA program, I was repeating this, that same surrender that I'd made 40 years ago. At the end of this month on the Feast of St. Ignatius Loyola, I'll celebrate my 40th anniversary as a Jesuit. I made that surrender then. I made it again when I took vows. I made it again when I was ordained. But I must admit before you that I never made it so well and so completely as I've made it in this program. This program has helped me to understand what is that surrender, what is the nature of that surrender. In the third step, we say we turn, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. As I've heard it said in meetings, not as I misunderstood him. And it's not as I read about him, not as I heard about him. You know, there's the President of the United States, Reagan, I believe his name was. I read about him, and I heard about him. But I didn't know him. I didn't know him. And I've read about and I've heard about God, but I can say that I didn't know him. But in this program, I'm coming to know him. I'm coming to know God, to recognize God each day in my life. The book written by an AA member called The New Pair of Glasses. That now I can see. Now I can see. I can see the miracles around me. When I first entered the program, I had a sponsor. A very caring, insightful man. And he said, Roy, when you go to meetings, listen carefully. Because God is going to speak to you. And don't try to figure out ahead of time who it's going to be. It might be the oldest person there. It might be the youngest, 13 or 14 years old, still close to their pain. 
It might be the most comely. It might be the ugliest. It might be the thinnest. It might be the heaviest. You don't know who God is going to use to bring you his message. And I believe that. And he told me also that when you listen and you find yourself being distracted and you catch yourself, say, excuse me, God, I wasn't listening. And go back and pay attention again. And if you are called on to speak and God chooses to use you as the vehicle to carry his message to the others, don't get in his way. I have a penchant after many years of studies to use big words and flowery language. I've backed up a bit from that practice, the showman kind. I was at a prison once, and I guess I was using language I was more accustomed to in more scholarly areas. And afterwards, this man came up to me. Rufus was his name, and he says, Roy, he says, you show do talk educated. <laughs> And my chest went out a little further than my stomach on that occasion. <laughs> I said, why, thank you, Rufus. And he says, I only wish I knew what the hell you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, God. God speaks to me. God is not going to give me an apparition, come down and say, Here I am, Roy. i got news for you. i got a message for you. God's going to lean over and tap somebody on the shoulder. He says, Hey, slip this one to Roy. He needs to hear it. <laughs> it's a young man I was driving home from a meeting one night. He had recently entered the program through rehab where they learned something about the steps. And we reached the front of his house, and before he jumped out, he said, Roy, you have a few minutes? I said, yes, I do. He said, would you mind doing a tenth step with me? I said, well, sure. I didn't know what I was getting into. You know, no harm in doing a tenth step. So he started with his morning and how he woke up and the prayers. And during the day, how he hung out with some of the kids in the class and how some of them in the car just wanted him to go out and back over the hill and to do some weed and how he hung out with some of the other kids that uh, he had been using with, and how he found a great temptation to go with them, but finally broke away. How he went to the meeting and was distracted, was chatting with his neighbor at the meeting instead of paying attention. And he finished off with some resolution about tomorrow. And I said, Sean, that's beautiful. That's just great. And he looked at me with this expression of expectation, and he said, well. I said, well, what? said, you said you'd do one with me. It's your turn. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> After I left the rehab in Michigan, it would be difficult. It was difficult in the middle of the academic year to find a position at a college or university, so I had to sit out the next nine months which I did at a Jesuit residence in Michigan. Half of the residence was a retreat house, and the other half had been leased to a recovery program, Insight, 55 residential clients. And we had the opportunity to take some of the clients out to AA meetings, and I signed up to take a couple of kids that were there across the city to my home group, the men's group over at the hospital, in Crittenden Hospital, about a half-hour drive. But somebody at the meeting at, at the rehab that night got long-winded, and consequently the clients weren't able to leave for the meeting to about 10 minutes before the scheduled meeting time. There's no way I could get across the city and be in time. And the result was I had to go down to the church at the foot of the hill and go down to the basement where the chicken farmers kick the shit off their shoes and go down there and talk about their, their experience, strength, and hope in the program. Well, on the way down, I was pissing and moaning to these guys, talking about, geez, how we, we didn't get over to my favorite meeting and who the windbag was up to, in their program. We get down there and we sit at a table in the cafeteria. And the practice up there is that as each table fills up, that becomes the discussion group, and there may be eight or ten discussion groups going on in the room. 
whereas in Syracuse you get to 40, 50 people, you form one great big circle that allows each one three seconds to say, I pass, while the next one goes. <laughs> but, there, but there the practice was each, each group, uh, each table formed its own group. And the result was that as the two teenagers and I sat there, other people came in and more and more young people came in. Of course, they came over and joined our table. And when the meeting started, they asked me, is the geriatric in the crowd, if I would chair the meeting? And I accepted. As we went around the table, this one young girl, as soon as she tried to open her mouth and start talking, she started crying. And I said, well, you collect yourself. We'll come back. And I went back a second time. And again, she couldn't talk. She just started crying. The third time I came back, I said, well, you don't have to speak. She said, I have to. And she started talking, told about how just a half hour before the meeting, she got a phone call that one of the kids she was using with that weekend was found dead in his room. Parents broke the door down because he hadn't come out. And this was her first contact with death and the fear and the, the guilt and the shame and everything I was just pouring over her just spilled out on the table. Now, if you're chairing the meeting, what do you say? What's your next line? I don't know what I said. But I know when the meeting was over, there's a lot of hugging, a lot of tears. I climbed in the car with the two young men. We drove back up the hill. And as we're driving up there, the one kid turns to me. He says, you know, Roy, he says, you were pissing and moaning on the way down the meeting tonight. I said, yeah. He says, don't you see? He says, the higher power didn't want you over the other side of the city tonight. He needed you here. He says, why don't you let go and let God? <laughs> Thirty-five years in religious life, and I'm taking spiritual direction from a drug addict. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> God uses us as his instruments. I walked into the lobby of that house, and there was a man sitting there with his little daughter. He had been coming in regularly to visit with his wife, who was, as he explained to the child, in therapy. Mama's in therapy for her drugs and alcohol. And he said, Father, I've got to talk to you. I said, sure, what's happening? He said, last night, I took Susie home. I tucked her in, and I went in the living room, and I popped a beer, and I lit a joint, and I was sitting there watching the football game, and Susie rolls out of the bed and climbs and comes into the living room and eyeballs me and says, Daddy, you ought to go to therapy too, and turned around and went to bed. And he said, I felt like I had been hit by lightning. He said, I dumped the beer and the joint down the toilet, and this morning I called the rehab, and they're going to take me in. And so I started at AA. And when Mama come out of rehab, Papa started. And God uses his little ones, and the little child shall lead them. I'm aware of the presence of God in my life today as I was never aware before. And I see the miracles, and I hear about the miracles. And it's just awesome. The God that I understand today is not the God that I misunderstood before. I sometimes have a difficulty with the image of God as a caring father because I didn't have that experience. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen it on TV and in film. I kind of think what it might have been like, but it's not my experience. And when I image God, I find it more comfortable to image God as a caring mother. And a mother who not only loves her children, but loves them all the more tenderly when they're sick. And I can say, I'm sick, God. Take me in your lap and hug me for a while and let me rest. And that's my image of God. It doesn't mean that I deny any of the teachings or the traditions of my faith, the Catholic faith. But that's the way I feel comfortable with God's presence. So I began my fourth step. I was helped in this by my first sponsor, who said, Now look, you don't have to go back and remember every single time you threw a brick through the greenhouse window. He said, You just have to know that you threw bricks through greenhouse windows, or whatever else that phrase is used to um, stand for. 
What you want to do at this point in the fourth step is understand what is that person that you became? Who have you become? What kind of person are you? And I find the symptoms of my disease by going back and looking at my behaviors and say, yes, I'm an arrogant, self-centered person and this is what I have done that tells me and shows me, yes, that's the kind of person I am. And I'm full of fear and this is what I've done in the past that shows me. And I'm full of anger and resentment and this is what I've done. And this shows me more about me. Hardly have we seen, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path except those who are incapable of being honest. And that honesty is not only regarding how many times I drank and what happened, but what was happening to me as a person. And that's my fourth step when I look and do that fearless inventory. The courage, that prayer, God grant me the courage to see myself as others see me. That's an awesome prayer. To look in the mirror and see the bloodshot eyes is only half as difficult as to look into the eyes of other people and see the contempt and fear and anger. In the sixth step, seventh step, when we ask, humbly ask God to remove these defects of character, that means I'm willing and I'm ready to hear the truth. And if somebody should come up to me and say, Roy, you know what's wrong with you? Oh boy, you know, I tremble. Somebody is going to criticize me. I could not distinguish between criticism and rejection. I couldn't stand rejection. I was rejected as a child, and I felt I had to buy acceptance. Buy acceptance by doing, by being successful, by proving to other people, see, I've made it. And I would tell people how I've made it and tell them of all the things I've done, the degrees I've earned and the awards I've got. And they would say, what an arrogant, self-centered son of a bitch. <laughs> and all I was trying to say was, see, I'm okay. Please like me. I didn't know how to ask for it. I didn't know how to say, I need you. And by trying to show people I was self-sufficient, I was pushing them away and saying, I don't need you. See, I've done it on my own. They say, okay, we don't need you either, Buster. <laughs> That's lonely. It's very lonely. It's extremely lonely. And to be able to say, I need help. One person who cares about me very much asked me one day, he said, Roy, do you ever go to meetings to ask for help? Or do you just go to meetings to see if there's anybody there you can help? Ouch. Ouch. That arrogance, that putting myself on a pedestal and saying, well, is there anything I can do for you? Anything I can do for you? Hmm? Here to help. Oh, boy, Jesus, you know, wave my flag. <laughs> and to suddenly discover, I need help. I'd be sitting at a meeting, a step meeting. I love step meetings. And we're going around the table and each of us sharing our own experience, strength, and hope. And some of the people just before me, and especially the young people, the teenagers in their early 20s, had that honesty and openness. And they'll say something that, my God, I've never had the courage to say anything like that out loud in front of another person. And the momentum of the meeting picks up and I speak and suddenly I catch myself saying things I've never said before that honesty, that growing awareness. It's okay. It's okay to be me. It's okay to tell you what my shortcomings are, my fears. I used the expression one night at a meeting. I said, somehow I want, I want to be approved so much I feel like the golden retriever that, that climbs into the laps of guests. You know. And finally the owner takes it and puts it in the cellar stairs and closes the door and I find myself that golden retriever on the other side of the door scratching, whining, you know. Let me come in and climb in somebody's lap. You know. And I use that expression at the meeting because that's the way I felt. And afterwards, I was surrounded by people that wanted to give me hugs to tell me I was okay. I didn't have to beg or cry for approval. I didn't have to buy it. I didn't have to pretend I didn't need it. Suddenly, I belonged. 
In this program of AA, I stop playing God. Independent, I can do everything, and I don't need help in doing it. To one is very dependent and aware of my dependence. I've become part of the human race. I've become part of God's children. I was at a prison meeting in Auburn one night, and one of the Muslims were talking about the 11th step, and one of the Muslims said, you know, I love you because I see God within you. It's the tenet of our faith that God resides in each of us. And when I've lost touch with the fact that God resides in each of you, because I've lost touch with the fact that God lives in me, and I must go back to my cell and get on my knees and once again search to make contact with that God that's within me and to invite him back. It's awesome to go into the prisons and to find there the men who have a spiritual faith and a grasp of God that's eluded me for all these years in which I pretended that I was the professional. It's awesome. I was at the meeting in the prison one night and we got talking about a day at a time. And one of the inmates in speaking said, I'm doing two life sentences plus a hundred years. But those are only words. There's no reality behind them. Those are only words. And the only reality is the present moment. This is the only moment I'm alive. I'm not alive yesterday. I'm, tomorrow isn't here yet. I'm not alive tomorrow. I'm just alive today. This is the only moment I'm alive. And I have to use this moment because this is the gift that I'm given. Right now. And when I wake up in the morning, I suddenly realize I have freedom. And freedom is not the opportunity to do anything I want to do. Freedom is the opportunity to freely choose between those options available. I had never thought of that. He said, I can't take a long walk without making a lot of U-turns. But I can choose to walk or sit in my shit. When I wake in the morning, I have a choice to thank God for the day or to curse Him for being here in the prison. I have the choice when I pass my brothers in the car or in the cell block or down in, in the yard to lighten their burden or to make it heavier. I choose to lighten it. And when that man goes through his day, he finds people coming to him asking to have their burdens lightened. He has found purpose in a prison. And he has the joy and the peace that I've been searching for for many years. Service, I got involved in service early on in the program. Service is the response to that prayer when you ask God to seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, seeking only knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. I said, what's your will? He says, get into service. <laughs> I said, what? Says, service, spelt with an S. <laughs> How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Do I love this program? What have I given back? Service? Yes. Drive people to meetings? Help clean up after the meetings. Become a GSR, DCM. Allow myself to be a servant on even higher levels. To be able to go into the detox units and carry the message, the message of love and acceptance and it's okay to be sick. How do I love thee? How do I love AA? How can I make it stronger so that those who come in years from now will find as strong a program there and a presence there as I found when I came in? What am I giving back? The gratitude, the gift that was given to me that I might pass it on. Twelfth step is that carrying that message, going out, Allowing myself to become that instrument of God's peace. The text in the 12 and 12 says, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. The problem I've struggled with for many years 
is that whenever I enjoyed some success in what I was doing, I was proud of my success. And I was looking around for people to applaud and acknowledge, hey, you're okay, man, you're okay. You're... Nowadays I'm learning, not always successfully practicing, but becoming more aware that any success I enjoy is God's success. The chisel in the hand of the artist does not take credit for the statue carved. I can't take credit. I can only thank God for allowing me to be used in his work. I had difficult times when I was addressing step six and seven. When I first started addressing it, I looked at it only in the context of a sinful behavior. Then I realized, no, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is just the human behavior. That the those things that I have about me, the the, the behaviors, the personality that, that pushes people away, that makes me less lovable. I recall when I first went to rehab, we each had to visit with the psychologist, and he asked me, Roy, what do you want most in the world? I said, to be loved. And I started crying. He said, well, we're going to help you to let it happen. And this is the process I find in my sixth and seventh step to grow up, is to take down those barriers that separate me from other people. To take away those that need to pretend, that need to strut, that need to use big words. And to say, I need you. I need you. I need your love. I need your caring. I need to belong, to be part of. And in that sixth step, I wanted to grow up. God, I wanted to grow up. I had spent too long playing at it and not getting serious at it. And suddenly this program gave me a structure, gave me a way to do it a day at a time, gave me the courage as I walk into rooms and hear other people speak. That courage, serenity prayer, the courage to change. That courage means for me to do something in the face of fear. And the thing I fear most is not speaking in front of a crowd of a thousand people. The thing I fear most is to telling you who I am. Because you might reject me and that's all I have. The fear of taking off all these adornments that I've laid on me. That try to say and pretend that I'm okay. Those things one hangs on the walls. The measures of success of what you drive and where you live. By those measures of success I had been a success. But by the measures of success as a human person... I was woefully wanting. And that progress, that growth in becoming more fully human, in becoming more fully me, is the gift of this program. We talk about freedom. I allege that this program has given me a freedom that I never realized. Has given me a freedom to become the me I might yet be. There's a Roy down inside of me someplace that's yearning to come out, to play in the sun, and to be hugged and loved, and to be able to do good things in God's name. And that Roy is being released a day at a time, being nurtured and encouraged and strengthened by the meetings I go to. I am free today to become the me I might yet be. There's a poem that I had learned many years ago and were urged not to bring in outside literature into the AA meetings and so I brought with me a copy of the book lest anybody wishes to challenge me this is AA comes of age <laughs> and in the back is the text of speeches given by different people at that anniversary in St. Louis and one of the speakers was a Father Ed Dowling, also a Jesuit priest, who was a close friend of Bill Wilson. And in the story of AA, you'll read about Father Dowling and how he was first thought to be just another drunk coming to bother Bill and turned out to be one of Bill's closest friends to help him understand the spiritual nature of the program. In the Jesuits, in the Society of Jesus, which is 450 years old this year, St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits, is famous for his work on the spiritual exercises. 
a series of reflections and meditations that look on the nature of the human being and that the person's relationship to God. And Father Dowling was the first to recognize the close similarity between the 12 steps of AA and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and became an, a, a vigorous advocate for the AA program, even though he himself was not an alcoholic. I like the poem that I'm about to quote from because it tells the story of the soul that's fleeing from God. As a young Jesuit friend of mine went to a hospital in New York City, and as most of us when we go to AA meetings, we don't wear our black suit with a little bunny collar. We, we go in, in mufti. And coming out of the meeting in the, the uh, hospital cafeteria, there's a nurse standing outside the door, and she said, uh, a couple of you guys come down emergency. We've got a real live one down there, and I think he could use some help from you guys. So Patrick and some other went down to the emergency room, where they saw this frail creature lying on the cot. By the aroma in the room, you knew he hadn't bathed in a long time. The sallow, sunken cheeks, the dark skin covered with dirt, the long hair unshampooed for months and months. And he was shaking. And Patrick told him that they were from AA and was greeted with some blue air. And he explained that, well, we're not here to, to chastise you. We're here to help you recognize that this is a disease. And he went on to explain the nature of his own ailment and how he had addressed it. And the two of them sat and talked with this old man for a while. And then Patrick said, well, we have to leave now. I'm going to leave my card with the nurse. And if you wish to speak tomorrow, I'll come back down. Just have the nurse call the number. And by the way, on the card it mentions that I'm a priest. But I'm not here because I'm a priest. I'm here because I'm a recovering drunk. And I share with you my pain and my recovery to help you accept yours. There's a silence from the man on the cot and finally he said, I am a priest too. Ten years ago I was excommunicated by my bishop because I wouldn't stop drinking. Under holy obedience I wouldn't stop drinking. I kept on drinking and I was thrown out. And I've drifted all over the country. In the last three years I've lived in the steam tunnels on the New York City getting my food out of garbage pails and panhandling. Within three days, he was at guest house where I'd had my graduate course in alcoholism. And he's now pastor of his own parish of a church down in the southwest. And this fleeing, this running from God that takes place in each of us that I experienced through those years and seeing myself becoming worse and worse, identifying myself with the Judas who betrayed Christ and finally recognizing that I was like St. Peter who sat outside the gate and said, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. And then as Christ left, Peter recognized what he had done and wept. And I tell you, many tears have left my eyes. The grief and remorse was about two months ago I was reading, preparing the gospel for the homily and it was the story of Christ after the resurrection was on the beach. And he was preparing some fish at a fire. And Peter and some of the other boys are out in the boat and they say, Hey, look, there's Jesus on the beach. And Peter wrapped something around him and jumped in the water and rushed onto the beach. And it dawned on me. Peter didn't run to the back of the boat and hide and say, God, I hope he doesn't see me. He was joyous. He was happy. He was free. Free to run in and... and, and and just say, hey, it's good to see you again. And I realized I had been hiding in the back of the boat, afraid to run forward, afraid to accept the fact that I had been forgiven. Fleeing, fleeing, fleeing from God. The shame and the guilt that drives us. And so Father Dowling, in speaking at the 15th anniversary of AA, when AA was turned over to the trustees and the the General Service Board. He quotes from a poem by Francis Thompson called The Hound of Heaven. And it reflects each of our story. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of mine own mind. In the midst of tears I hid from him. 
under laughing water, up fisted hopes I sped, and shot precipitated the down titanic glooms of chasmed fears. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. And again, Christ, in speaking to the fleeing soul, says, Is not the gloom that o'ershadows thee, naught but the shade of my hand outstretched caressingly? And that which I took from thee, I took not for thy harm's sake, but only that thou might find it in my arms. Come, rise, take my hand, and be with me. God love you. I love you. Thank you for loving me.